advised. This is 10 Minute Murder. In 1973, many American families believed it was safe for their young children to wander the streets alone. Neighborhoods were considered to be a safe space, full of trustworthy people who looked out for one another. It was a year before Ted Bundy and BTK started killing, giving the 70s a reputation of being the start of the golden age of serial killers, and still several years before parents would truly begin teaching their kids about stranger danger. All of this meant that during Halloween of 1973, nine-year-old Lisa Ann French's parents didn't have any reservations about letting their daughter go trick-or-treating alone. The fourth grader had initially planned to spend the night with her friend, Ann Parker, but Ann got grounded by her parents, leaving Lisa to make her way to the neighborhood party alone, trick-or-treating as she went along. Just before 6 p.m., Lisa left her house. She was proud of her costume, she dressed up like a hobo, wearing a green jacket and black hat, and had painted freckles on her face. She stopped by several houses before she decided to knock on the door of another neighbor, a man named Gerald Miles Turner Jr. Lisa wasn't visiting the houses of complete strangers. She'd knocked on the doors of one of her classmates and a teacher from her school, and had stopped by to chat with both people before collecting her candy and going on her way. Gerald Turner also wasn't a stranger to Lisa. He and his girlfriend Arlene had recently had a child together, and Lisa loved to say hello to the baby whenever she saw him. That night, she rang Gerald's doorbell, and after he opened the door, she walked into the doorway to collect her candy. Nobody else was home with Gerald that night. He began talking to Lisa and managed to convince her to come inside the house and into his bedroom. At about 7 p.m., Gerald's girlfriend, Arlene, arrived at the house. She noticed that he was acting weird. He was only dressed in a bathrobe and kept repeatedly visiting the bedroom, saying that he needed to lie down because he was feeling sick. Arlene spent about an hour at home before leaving again to visit her mother. Lisa French did not return home that night. Her curfew was at 7 p.m., and when there was still no sign of her, her mother alerted the neighborhood. Over the next few hours, a group of concerned neighbors were out searching the streets for any sign of Lisa. The search grew quickly over the next few days, and the authorities became more and more concerned for Lisa's well-being, and eventually, the entire county was searching. There were more than 5,000 volunteers involved in the search, as well as the police and the U.S. National Guard. On the 3rd of November, 1973, at 11.30 a.m., a local farmer was driving his tractor when he saw two plastic bags that had been left in a field. He looked closer and saw that the naked body of a young girl had been stuffed into one of the bags while the other one contained a Halloween costume. The body was identified as Lisa Ann French. Lisa's autopsy revealed that she had two potential causes of death, asphyxiation and shock due to the brutal sexual assault she had experienced shortly before she died. Her funeral was held three days after her body was found, and two days later, a $10,000 reward was announced for the arrest of the killer. Early in the investigation, police already had a key suspect, Gerald Turner, but despite repeated questioning, he continued to insist that he was innocent. Almost a year after Lisa's death, Gerald performed a polygraph test, which came back as having inconclusive results. He refused to repeat the test. But finally, he did confess to everything. Shortly after luring Lisa into the house, Gerald said he attacked her, removed her clothing, and assaulted her. Either during that assault or immediately afterwards, Lisa died. He noticed that she was no longer breathing. Gerald listened to her chest and believed that she still had a heartbeat. During the process of trying to resuscitate Lisa, Arlene arrived home, and Gerald panicked knowing that he had to hide Lisa's body as soon as possible. While Gerald had been pretending that he needed to lie down in the bedroom, he had actually been in the bathroom where he left Lisa's body. Immediately after Arlene left the house that night, Gerald rushed to dispose of Lisa. 
He placed her remains and clothing into bags and drove into a field, where he then dumped the bags. Throughout the disposal process, he wore socks on his hands, hoping that he would not leave any fingerprints behind. Shortly after Lisa's death, Gerald wrote a letter, which was found by investigators. In the letter, he wrote, quote, I doubt that I could ever fully realize the terror you experienced at my hands. I can still see you standing in the doorway with that felt hat, beaming at having recognized me. Then I see the delight in your eyes turn to fear as I close the door behind you. For as long as I can remember, I've had bouts with keeping focus and memory recall. I realized, after researching, it's pretty common, so chances are what I'm about to say resonates with you as well. I've tried to push through it in the past with copious amounts of caffeine and a handful of supplements. That works a little bit, but there are some days where I can remember the lyrics to every 90s song ever, but I can't remember what's on my to-do list that day. Doing this podcast, being a dad, and having a regular job, it all takes a toll on me mentally and physically. There came a point when I realized I should stop trying to do it myself through trial and error and lean on a tasty drink I found called Magic Mind. If you're like me and you've never really felt true mental clarity before, it's a little shocking at first using Magic Mind. I noticed first the bump of energy that it gives me. That's the matcha going to work. It also helps to extend the benefits of caffeine so you don't have the typical crash. There are other ingredients in Magic Mind that help with anxiety, attention span, memory, inflammation, and just overall immunity. It makes me feel dialed in, sharp, like I've never been before. And I'm generally a skeptical person. So when I see a claim that says they help with focus, energy, and creativity, I wanted to try it for myself. So for a month now, I have. And does it work? It absolutely does. As I mentioned, it's not like some big lightning bolt of energy that surges through you. But one of the things you'll notice first is your brain fog lift. I'm able to focus at a level I usually can't. If you've even had occasional problems with focus and energy like I have, even anxiety and memory recall, I'm telling you to give Magic Mind a try. And starting in January, you'll find it in all Sprouts Farmers Market stores across the country. If you have a Sprouts store nearby, get down there and grab a few bottles to try. After you're hooked, like I know you will be, you can get a subscription with 50% off using my code 10MinuteMurder. Spell out the 10. You can also go to magicmind.com slash 10MinuteMurder, and I'll put this information in the episode description, but 50% off is a massive deal on Magic Mind, and it is not going to last forever. So go try it today. After his confession, Gerald was convicted of second-degree murder, acts of sexual perversion, and enticing a child for immoral purposes in February of 1975. He received a sentence of 38 and a half years behind bars, but after only 17 years in 1992, he was paroled for good behavior. His release caused an uproar in the Milwaukee community where he was set to live during parole. In November of 1993, Gerald's parole ended after the Department of Corrections stated that his release for good behavior had been miscalculated. The protests and outrage about his release led to the creation of Turner's Law, a law that meant criminals who had been released from prison could be legally detained in mental health facilities if they were believed to be likely to continue criminal activity. But despite the law being named after the case, the jury at Gerald's 1998 parole hearing found that he wasn't eligible for being detained at a mental health facility. In fact, despite Gerald's conviction for being a violent sexual predator, the jury concluded that he was not a violent sexual offender after all, so there was no reason for him to be detained. The ruling meant that Gerald's second parole could begin later that year. During July of that year, the state tried to revoke Gerald's parole again after an incident in his halfway house where he brandished a butcher knife while yelling at his caseworker. Despite a psychiatrist assessing Gerald and ruling that he was still a danger to others, the judge ruled that Gerald's parole should go ahead. On parole, Gerald still struggled to get a job due to his crimes. When the waste management company refused to hire him after finding out about Lisa's murder, Gerald filed a complaint where he accused the company of discriminating against him. In the settlement, the company was forced to hire Gerald after all, 
because of a law in Wisconsin at the time stating that businesses should only take criminal convictions into account if the crime was substantially related to the job they were hiring for. Because Gerald wouldn't be working with children at the company, there was legally no reason that they could refuse to hire him. That law was eventually repealed, allowing employers to refuse to hire felons at their own discretion. But it didn't matter to Gerald for long. In 2003, he violated his parole by possessing what was described as an abundance of pornography and spent another 15 years in prison. He was set to be released from his sentence in February of 2018, but as that date grew closer, Lisa's mother created a petition against his release, which gathered more than 30,000 signatures. On the 23rd of February 2022, a judge decided that Gerald's release should be denied, and the decision was made to detain him at a high-security psychiatric facility instead. From the early days of the case, Gerald was nicknamed the Halloween Killer because of the night when the crime had coincidentally taken place. A holiday where creepy things were used in a fun way had become genuinely scary for Wisconsin residents, leaving a lingering shadow that made people look at their own neighbors in a different light. Gerald Turner himself believed that Lisa's murder only attracted public attention because it had taken place on Halloween night. Quote, If it had happened on some other day, like Valentine's Day, he said, nobody would have gave a damn. That's 10-Minute Murder for today, brief and bingeable true crime. I'm Joe, the host, and I really appreciate you listening. And Joe, why did you choose December to do this episode when it's the Halloween killer? You could have done this in October. That's an excellent question, and the answer is, I forgot. Someone requested that I cover this story back in October. I totally spaced out, thought I had, I didn't, so here it is now. My bad. Hey, if you're new to 10-Minute Murder, welcome. Make sure you go back and listen to all the back episodes that there are available and subscribe to the podcast so that you can never miss any of the new ones when they come out. If you do subscribe to 10 Minute Murder and are not following the show on social media, first of all, quit playing. Second, connect with me on social media, see the pictures of what we talk about here on the podcast. It's never gross and graphic stuff, though. If you like this episode, leave a rating and review on Apple, Spotify, any place that's possible because your positive feedback is appreciated and helps the show grow. Go to 10minutemurder.com for all things related to 10 Minute Murder. Now, quick listener email. Hello, Joe. I'm an OG listener from way back, and I think I've actually seen you in person. Or I saw someone that looked just like you. Either way, obviously I didn't say anything at the time, but I tell my friends I met you, so don't tell on me. My question is, it has been too long since you mentioned what's bothering you or your current pet peeve. So what is it? I heart your show, Megan in Florida. Hello, Megan in Florida. It is possible you saw me in Florida because I have been there. And just in case your friends are listening, it was very nice meeting you in Florida, Megan. So what's bothering me lately? Um, People that announce on Facebook that they are taking a break from Facebook, just go. Have a break. You don't have to tell anyone. A Facebook break, honestly, is probably pretty healthy. It feels like to me, and I could be wrong, but it feels like when I see that, they want people to say, no, no. Stay, stay here. Or they're just trying to, on the low, get someone to message them and say, hey, since you're taking a Facebook break, give me your number so I can still talk to you. But again, I could be wrong. Also, people that say espresso, that bothers me. All right, that's it. Thanks for listening to another 10-Minute Murder podcast episode. I'll see you on the next one.